Good evening, Girl Scouts. I am honored to be here. First of all, great thanks to your fabulous CEO, Stephanie Foote. Thank you for your hospitality. It's a pleasure to be here. Also to her great partner, her board chair, Connie Campbell, and to the entire board of directors here in Colorado, thank you for your service to the girls. I also want to thank Paula Hersmark and Elaine Gans Berman, obviously for their amazing work to support this wonderful evening, to organize it, to execute it in great Girl Scout style. I also want to thank Senator Reverend Luisa Guzman and, of course, Amber Luna and Ariel Sanchez for their introduction. So this is an amazing evening for us. It's an opportunity to come together, not only to celebrate some amazing women in your community, but talk about the meaning of Girl Scouts and why it's so important that we're here this evening reliving what our founder, Julie Gordon, knew from the very beginning. And that is how important it is that we invest in girls. For those of you in the room who were Girl Scouts, I think you will recall that special moment when you were penned, right? When you got your first badge and how important that was. And our mission has not changed over 100 years. It's clearly not only to get badges, but it is to grow the leadership structure in this country for girls, to keep them safe, to keep them focused. But as Juliet knew very early on, it was not only important to grow girls, it was important to engage in adults in communities across the country in this fabulous journey that we're on together. So what I wanted to do tonight was, in the presence of greatness, of Girl Scout history, to talk about how we, yes we, how we keep alive this amazing organization. So, you know, I have the opportunity and pleasure of being your national CEO. And today I met with a few of my bosses. Um, you may know that my bosses are actually ranging from the age of 5 through 17. And so when I travel across the country, I always make it a point to check in with my bosses. Don't you think that's a good idea? And I had an opportunity to sit down today with four amazing leaders, and they were telling me, how they were enjoying their Girl Scout experience. They were working toward their gold, gold award, and most of them had been in Girl Scouting for at least 10 years. In our vernacular, that's a general in our army. And I was asking them about their Girl Scout experience and why it was so important to them, and why it was so important that Colorado ensure that we are here 100 years from now. And they were saying, well, I, I like Girl Scouts because it's fun. I like Girl Scouts because it connects me with other girls. But what blew me away was they were innovating. They were taking what was great about our organization, but they're saying, Eagle One, oh, by the way, that's what the girls call me. Like, Eagle One, I got some advice for you. I said, okay, what's your advice? They said, well, you know, we like the badges and everything, but you got to do something about camp. I'm like, okay, well, what's your idea? And they said, well, We've been thinking about this. You know, we're older girls. We want some high-impact activities at camp. And, she, and they go, okay, all right. So I'm like, please proceed. They're like, yeah, we want to shoot guns. <laughs> I'm just saying. Now, before all the mothers run out of the room, right, I was sitting there listening to them, and but the way they were describing sort of the innovation around this, they said, look, we got a plan here. We're living with girls every day. And they want to do things in the communities. They want community service, but they want high-impact activities at camp. They want to go, you know, zip lining. They want to go do things that they can't do anywhere else. And then they said, well, Eagle One, the other thing is, I think you need to turn camps co-ed. Now, so I bring this up because all of you are like, oh, here we go. And I've got Lorraine Aurelian in the room, who is obviously an icon in our movement. So she's going to kick me off stage here if I go down this path anymore. But what I guess I'm saying is, 
It is the time to sit back and listen to our girls and listen to them very closely about what they need. And maybe shooting guns at the age of 10 is not appropriate, but <laughs> what they also told me was they want to work on sustainability issues. They want to figure out how to improve the design of fabrics around nanotechnology. They were describing to me the importance of our writing badge because it gave one of them an opportunity to write about the history of genocide in this world. Now, I tell you this story because I think there is a perception about Girl Scouts. Come on now, we're a family. Let's talk about it for a second. Right? You know, we have a very strong brand. I've tested it. Okay, I went out there and I compared it and asked a company, compare the Girl Scout brand to other organizations. We're the 16th strongest brand in the company, excuse me, in the world. Yes. You can compare us to Target, McDonald's, we're right up there. And when I talk about Girl Scouts, the first time I meet people, they're like, oh, you're with Girl Scouts? And they smile, right? Because they remember our brand, but for some people, they think of it as the three C's. What are they? I heard it, camps, crafts, and cookies. All right. So first of all, I embrace our cookie program. Okay? How many of you sold Girl Scout cookies growing up? How many of you bought Girl Scout cookies? All right. Did you realize, did you realize when you sold cookies or you bought cookies, you were actually investing in the largest entrepreneur program for girls in this country, if not this world? Yes. And the girls, my bosses, are not shy, are not shy when they state their outcomes of their business. So you can smile and you can say, how cute, Girl Scout, but these Girl Scouts in less than five months raise $800 million, okay? Which, by the way, which one? I don't get a penny of it at National. It stays in their local community because guess what? guess what they do? They reinvest it back in their local communities. They do. They're funding your homeless shelters, your congregate meal sites, your animal shelters. They're rebuilding your local parks, your local libraries. They're funding their community service projects and their awards through our revenue. And they're learning critical business skills. Some of the most fascinating women I've met in business. They're leading Fortune 100 corporations. I meet them at meetings, they're like, Anna, it's going great. I'm loving my job. Thank you, because I learned my business skills selling Girl Scout cookies. Now, I tell you the story about our brand and our Girl Scout cookies, because here is the reality. Our girls, from the very beginning, at, as they began selling cookies, have been self-financing their leadership journey. Let me say that again. Our girls have been self financing their leadership journey in Girl Scouts. Now, it's a good thing, right? They're empowered. They're self-defined. But they need help because that method, this business model that we've developed for 100 years can no longer sustain our movement. It's not enough because there are waiting lists and waiting lists of girls across this country who want to be Girl Scouts. But there are financial barriers for them. Our local Girl Scout councils, like the one here, run by Stephanie, great, but they need more investments from adults. Did you know that on a national basis, on a national basis, people invest more in animal causes than they do in girl causes? Okay, don't get me, don't get me wrong. I love animals. 
I do. But as I told the President of the United States in the Oval Office last year, the next president will be a woman and she will be a Girl Scout. And by the way, I also shared with him that we have 59 million alum. 59 million women in the United States were part of our organization. That means one in two American women wore our bat. Right here. Okay? And guess what else I said? Not only do they volunteer more in the community than other women, they have higher levels of educational attainment, but they're not only doing that, they're community engaged. They're out there. They're volunteering. And, Mr. President, they vote and they vote often. And then he says to me, how many do you have? <laughs> so step back for a second. Investment. Girl Scouts works. Girls now, for almost 60 years, self-financing through a cookie program. We've got a waiting list of girls. We've got proof in the pudding. We've got outcomes that say if you're a Girl Scout, you're going to have higher levels of educational attainment, you're going to make more money a year, you're going to be happier with your decisions, you're going to give back more in your community. So why wouldn't you invest in this program? Why is it, why is it that my counterpart at Boy Scouts can raise more money a year for boys than I can for girls? And the, there's a current new Boy Scout CEO, but his predecessor literally invited my team. He was very gracious. He said, Anna, send your fund development team to, to Texas, Irving. I will host them. And the CEO of Boy Scouts himself sat my team down and said, this is how we raise money for boys in the United States. And it was fantastic. You know what they do? It's fascinating. Well, first of all, let me see if you can guess. Let me go back a couple of years. Three years ago, how much money do you think my counterpoint at Boy Scouts, with his team at the national level, raised for boys from adults? So this is adult-generated revenue. This is no popcorn money, nothing that the boys raise. These are adults donating to Boy Scouts to support boys in the United States. If you had a guess. I'm going to tell you. Approximately $56 million. How many, how many millions do you think we raised three years ago for girls that same year? Four. Okay, so you know what? Congratulations to the men. They have figured out an amazing way to raise money, to raise the opportunity for people to invest in boys. And let me tell you, I'm loving that because I'm raising an 11-year-old boy and also raising 2 million girls. But that 11-year-old boy, I want him to have every opportunity that he can possibly have. All I'm asking for is it there to be some gender equality when it comes to investment in our girls. Because this is not about boys against girls or men against women. This is about the future viability of this country. And as leaders of this globe, we've got to get it together for girls. Because unfortunately, my years in government, both at the federal and local level, taught me some, unfortunately, unfortunately, some very disturbing information. I had the opportunity to work in a state where I helped the governor on an annual basis set the capital construction budget for our prisons based on the fourth grade dropout rate in Arizona. I could predict with her by fourth grade the number of kids we're losing in the educational system and how many how many beds in prison we need to start building to stay up with demand? I also had to fund all the domestic violence shelters in the state, the congregant meal sites, the homeless shelters. And unfortunately, I had to imprison girls. 
And one day I went and I took the governor because I wanted her to hear these stories and I sat her down with four girls. And they were telling the governor their stories. Average age, 15 years old. And there was one in particular. We heard her story and I said, tell the governor, tell her your story. Her story was this. She was back in the detention center, incarcerated for the second time, pregnant with her second child at 15 years old. And unfortunately, she had been incarcerated because she had been arrested for selling drugs. And the reason she was incarcerated is because she hadn't made her quota selling crack cocaine. And her parents called the police to get her arrested, not because she was selling crack cocaine because they had a quota for her. It's because her best friend was in a rival gang and he was helping her sell the coke. That was the wrong thing to do. So she was sitting there in prison telling the governor the story and the governor was sitting there going, I can't believe this. Because this young lady said, you know, governor, you can do everything you want to do. You can teach me new skills in prison. You can teach me how to cook. But here's the reality. The minute I get out of here, I'm going back to that same neighborhood. I'm going back to the same poverty cycle. I'm going back to the same family structure. And the governor said, well, what would you say to your little sister? And she paused and she looked at the governor. And she said, I would tell her just to be a girl. Now for me, that told me a lot. That somehow in this country, we have lost our way when it comes to our youth. That when a girl has to sit there and convince adults that we need to surround them with caring adults in a safe space for them to self-develop in a way that they have the self-confidence to say, no, I don't want to do that. That we've lost our way. And so I left government and I went straight into Girl Scouts. People thought I had lost my mind. My boss was going on to work for the President of the United States and I went sight unseen to San Antonio, Texas to work for a local Girl Scout Council. Because I knew I knew we had to fight this battle. And I knew that I had to be part of an organization that had the scale, had the experience, had the knowledge, the passion, the mission to actually get this done. Not 50 years from now, not 100 years from now, but now. Because every day that goes by, we lose another generation of girls. We don't have the time. We don't. And as I go around trying to convince people about our mission and the necessity of this mission to invest in girls, I hear why. Girls, it's a soft public policy issue. But I bet you this girl in prison didn't think it was a soft public policy issue. And I bet you the other girl sitting in Colorado that we cannot reach because of lack of resources would also say, that they are missing a great opportunity. So my message to you tonight is pretty simple. It's this, that now is the time to stand up for Girl Scouts. Now is the time to pick up the phone, your iPhone, your Android, call a friend, send a text to your closest 50 friends and say, how are you going to help girls in this country today? Are you going to sign up to be a troop leader? Are you going to make a donation to your local Girl Scout Council? How are you going to support them? Because if we don't do it, who's going to do it? If we don't make this the top issue in this country so that everybody is talking about how we're investing in girls, who else is going to do it? So for me, it, it's a pretty simple task. All we have to say is that if you invest in Girl Scouts, we're going to invest in girls. And we're going to multiply it, we're going to scale it. Because at the end of the day, our founder, Julie Gordon Lowe, if she was here to say, she was here today, standing next to me, she would look at me and say, Ana Maria Chavez, you're the 19th CEO of Girl Scouts.
You're the first woman of color to lead this great iconic organization. But you know what? Your job's not done. We have a long way to go. And when I was at her gravesite last year on March 12, 2012, when we turned 100, I made her a promise. I said, Juliet, we're going to grow. I'm never going to let this flame go out, not on my watch. And if I have to go to every street corner, every community center, every state hall to talk about these issues, I'll go there. But I also said I can't do it alone. So tonight, will you stand with me? Will you stand with the girls we currently serve? Will you stand with me with the girls that unfortunately we've lost in other systems? Will you stand with me to ensure that we're investing in girls? Will you stand with us? Will you stand with us? Is a girl worth it? Thank you, Colorado. On my honor. I want to thank uh, Anna Marie for.